Hello. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Sanne Bogus, and we are about to start a webinar for WeFish, uh, the potential from WeFish on the European market. We will start in one minute. So I think it's uh, four o'clock, at least in the Netherlands. Um, so uh, welcome everyone uh, to this webinar about uh, the European market for reef fish. Um, this webinar is organized by the Center for the Promotion of Imports from Developing Countries, CBI. Uh, we are part of uh, the Netherlands Enterprise Agency and uh, funded mainly by the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but we also conduct uh, projects for the European Union. And um, one of these uh, projects is um, uh, Connecting Central America, um, and which is aimed at strengthening the competitiveness of uh, SMEs, uh, small and medium-sized enterprises in Latin America, in Central America, I mean, um, and connecting them to the European market. And this program is coordinated by the Secretariat for Central American Economic Integration, or SHECA. And uh, this, uh, this webinar on WeFish is uh, uh, organized in this um, uh, framework. Uh, my name is Sonne Bogus. I'm a program manager at CBI uh, Market Intelligence, uh, responsible for the fish and seafood sector. Um, CBI offers market intelligence on the European market for 14 different sectors, ranging from fish and seafood uh, to IT outsourcing, apparel, tourism, uh, fresh fruit and vegetables, you name it. Um, and our market intelligence is specifically aimed at uh, exporters from developing countries. It con it is free, uh, available online, and it contains a lot of practical uh, tips and information uh, on how to best enter the European markets. Um, for the fish and seafood uh, sector, our market research is uh, mainly conducted by the Seafood Trade Intelligence Portal, or STIP. And today, our market researcher, Sophia Balot, uh, you will see her uh, webcam, um, will present to you uh, the research they have done on the European market for reef fish. And she will do so together with one of our sector experts, uh, which is John van Herwijn. Um, the focus in this, uh, of this webinar is exporting reef fish from uh, Central America. And so uh, many of the participants here are also from our program in Central America. However, we make sure it is interesting also for uh, exporters of reef fish uh, from other parts of the world. Um, yeah, so um, this webinar will take about uh, 75 minutes. Um, after my introduction, Sophia will start the presentation about the market potential. Um, and um, this part is followed by a question and answers uh, block. And after that, uh, our presenters will look into the different aspects of market entry, which is again followed by a questions and answers block. Um, this means that if you have any questions during the webinar, um, well, there are actually two options. As an attendee, you can raise your hand um, you can uh, do so uh, if you have in your console panel below, there's a small hand, you can raise your hand um, and we can uh, give you the, yeah, the floor, so to say. We can uh, unmute your, um, your voice uh, so you can uh, raise your question. 
the other way to uh, raise a question is to put your uh, question, write it down in the question and chat box, uh, which is also in your console panel. Um, yeah, I hope that is all uh, clear. Um, if you have any questions about that, um, well, I, I hope you can also uh, always find the question and answers uh, box. Um, let me see. Uh, after the, the the different information, the, pro, the question and answer blocks as well, I will give you a bit more of information about uh, CBI's market intelligence. Um, you should be able to see the presentation uh, on our screen, um, on, on your screen. Um, the presentation will also be sent to you after the webinar. And um, yeah, I, I, of course, I hope the connection remains stable. That is uh, very important. Uh, if there are any connection problems, um, be sure that we will try again and uh, try to stick with it uh, a few minutes uh, uh, if we, uh, just to make sure we are getting back. Um, I wish you all a very interesting and useful webinar and give the floor now to Sophia Balot. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Sophia again. Um, I'm uh, the market researcher from the Seafood Trade Intelligence Portal, and as Sana has said, um, we will be discussing today, together with John, um, the market potential and market entry for um, Reef Fish, um, a product that actually I am also familiar with, as I um, lived and was born also in the Philippines, where Reef Fish is a common uh, um, fish to be cooked at home. Uh, maybe, John, you can introduce uh, yourself a bit. Uh, yes, good morning, or uh, good afternoon, depends on when, where you are. Uh, I'm John, um, seafood to consultant all, uh, for SPIP, but also for uh, CBI. Uh, working in this area already uh, 23 years, so I try to help something about the reef fish. It's, uh, yeah, it's a nice sector, difficult to, uh, to study, because there's almost uh, no information about it. But uh, let's see what we can do uh, for today. We'll try. <laughs> yes. Okay. So first, uh, uh, we go to the market potential part, which is uh, will cover demand, opportunities, and trends in the European sector. So this is quite a a very niche market, I would say, for for Europe, as uh, it is usually used for in the ethnic and the food service industry um, in Europe, especially in Southern Europe. And they also have a very special place, for example, in cruise ships where there's also a lot of American tourists who are much more familiar with the product itself and uh, uh, basically the reef fish which will be covered in this uh, particular presentation will include grouper um, also snapper and also the parrot fish okay so let's go okay so first we have to um, first know what is the European demand for seafood in general does actually uh, Europe import a lot of seafood and as we see in this presentation that um, Europeans actually love to eat fish and uh, uh, in 2017 there was a 12.69 million tons consumed um, and also the trade balance is negative 11.75 billion in 2018 and what does that mean that means that Europe actually imports uh, much more seafood than it exports. So it is a very huge uh, market for um, for seafood in general. So now we move on to um, the 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 demand for reef fish. So is there actually a demand for reef fish? Because as we know in Europe, there um, the most uh, seafood that are in demand are usually shrimp, um, cuttlefish, octopus, or tuna. But is there actually demand for this very niche uh, product? Um, there is actually no direct data available on the harmonized system code. So that's, for example, um, that's a gauge whether how to, if we can uh, get the actual import and export uh, trade data for reef fish, but we based it on the fresh, chilled, frozen, and the fillets for seafood. So this is where the data for this particular study is based on. 
And as I mentioned earlier, these are the species that we are covering. And these are mainly sourced from developing countries. So if you're a developing country exporter, there, then indeed um, you have a potential to reach the European market. It is a very niche product that is uh, especially sold in Southern Europe, where there is already an established affinity and fondness for seafood, because there you really see that in Spain, Italy, France, for example, they are very much accustomed to eating um, a fresh fish as well as different kinds of fish so they are more exposed to these kinds of species and uh, of course with the food service industry especially in Asian restaurants um, also in very um, premium restaurants you can also see um, reef fish being served either as whole or grilled or also in fillets so later we'll find out which are the specific countries that have these uh, demand and also where is the ethnic population which is uh, the one that really uh, um, has the demand for this uh, product um, goes to. So which countries have these uh, large uh, ethnic populations? Okay, so we move on to the countries that are um, have these demand. Okay, so as I uh, mentioned earlier, Southern Europe has a very large appetite for seafood in general, and the main countries that are actually um, into the seafood uh, industry, because Either they are huge consumers of seafood themselves or are huge processors themselves are Spain uh, with 46.5 kilogram per capita and also Portugal. Spain, remember, is also a huge processor in, um, in Southern Europe. Therefore, there are lots of processing industries there, um, which you can also partner and tie up with. So then you can export your product um, further in within Europe. So for example, you can um, deal or you can uh, uh, make uh, do business with Spain or France, for example, and then uh, furthermore, you can reach other markets within Europe. Um, in terms of sustainability, it's not yet too important, um, but it is really a growing trend now, especially in France. So um, we see, we forecast that actually sustainability and the, the um, seals that are related to producing seafood, whether it's a wild caught or whether it's a um, farm, they are um, increasingly becoming important. And in Southern Europe, there is a mainstream availability because there are um, a lot of specialized fish shops in, um, in Southern Europe there in Europe and especially in Spain and France and therefore uh, people are exposed to it more you know when they go to the fish shops and they see a display of reef fish um, that's something that's typical for them um, but also remember that there could be some competition with the local species because as you know um, uh, uh, Spain, France, and Southern Europe is exposed to other fish, types of fish that are caught within the Mediterranean um, area or Mediterranean Sea, and therefore they, 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 you have some competition there. Okay, so then now let's look at uh, Northwestern Europe, where there is also a, um, a very huge ethnic population, for example, in Netherlands, um, Germany, United Kingdom, as well as in Belgium. Um, these are especially true uh, for urban areas where you can see a lot of, uh, um, they call it toko or the um, oriental shops where they, Asian food shops where they sell different kinds of species um, in the frozen section you would usually find. Um, also remember that United Kingdom, while it has a very large ethnic population of around 6 million, you also have to remember that we, they are in the process of exiting uh, Europe. And therefore, if you're going to deal with the UK um, or in Europe in general, make sure that your, um, your requirements also stand for the UK as they are now leaving Europe. Um, Switzerland and Austria actually has a, a, a nice uh, demand for snapper, red snapper in particular, and but they are in fillets. They are usually served in 170 70 to 220 grams of fillets in, a, in the food service sector, and it's regularly eaten uh, in restaurants. So if you're a developing country exporter looking into entering Northwestern Europe, then remember that it's usually consumed as fillets because um, in Northwestern Europe, it's uh, much more typical to eat the fish without the head and 
Um, that's unlike Southern Europe where they consume the fish sometimes in whole um, and usually also fresh. So it's very different uh, demand and also very different uh, kind of seafood culture in this uh, different parts of Europe. All right. Okay, so what are actually the seafood trends um, recently that you can um, uh, use and also learn from? Um, as you know, with the, also with the onset of um, the pandemic, uh, Europeans are becoming more health focused. And with the focus on health, that means that also they're very much more uh, sensitive and very much more demanding in terms of the food they eat, especially with seafood. And therefore they would demand a lot more on the um, safety, um, safety um, seals, also sustainability seals. So they want to know that the food they're eating are actually safe and healthy for them and they have met all of the requirements legally in Europe. And um, the frozen foods uh, section is also gaining market share. And why? It's because convenience is also a very rich trend now in Europe. And that means that people also wanted to cook uh, more inside their homes as people are uh, more um, confined in their homes, especially with the COVID. So they're looking for more convenience products. And that means, you know, stocking up on frozen fish, whatever that is in your fridge, and therefore cooking it at a time when you find convenient. And um, also in Europe, as you know, there is a, a growing uh, immigration and therefore, with that, uh, with the growing number of migrants staying in Europe, there is also a growth in ethnic food retail market. I, I myself, I'm, you know, I grew up with this fish, eating this fish, this fish, and it's called actually the snapper is called uh, Maya Maya in Philippines, and the uh, um, grouper is called Lapu Lapu, and we are very, um, very much fond of this fish. And I myself are looking for it, uh, but I only find actually a lot of fillets in um, the um, ethnic retail. For example, they're called Amazing Oriental or Tanger. I find them there. Um, also, they can be served in some restaurants in Asian markets as a whole, but it's very rare and also very quite expensive as well. Uh, yeah, so indeed, as as you know, as as more immigrants, as more uh, Europeans get exposed as well to um, other ethnic cuisines, also um, other cultures, and then they're also um, learn more. They also learn more about these kinds of fishes that they are not familiar with. And so therefore, the story behind your fish is very important. And that's why you need to also promote that. So what is the origin of your fish? Is it actually sustainable? Why, why would you want to eat fish? Um, and therefore, the aspects such as the marketing towards health or marketing towards the sustainability, how the fish is caught, um, for example, um, the fishermen that uh, this uh, fishery has helped. These are very um, good stories to tell to your to your buyers and to your importers. So this is um, something that you could invest in. All right. Okay. So I think we now move on to the first uh, round of Q and A. So there we have already mentioned some of the trends and some of the countries that are, um, yeah, just uh, where you can find a lot of potential. So maybe you can. Uh, if people have questions, then we can answer them. Thank you very much, uh, Sophia. Um, I think we uh, want to uh, start with a poll first, right? Uh, to know a little bit ah, okay. about. Yes. Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we have a yeah, poll indeed. for everyone. Uh, we hope everyone will uh, participate. Mm -hmm. And uh, which is, uh, where do you think the largest market potential for your wee fish in, is in the European market? Um, I will launch the, the poll now. Um, so, as you can see, the question is, is it in the mainstream retail market or the food service sector or the ethnic retail or specialized fish markets or all of the above? Um, looking forward to your responses. Results are coming in. <laughs> the winner is. Wow, well, it's meantime, really quite interesting how how there is such a diversity. Yeah.
in the meantime, I hope you can all hear us well. Um, I hear uh, from one colleague who has some problems. Um, otherwise, please let us know in the in the chat box. But it seems other people are not. Uh, I, I haven't received any messages uh, uh, except that one. So it seems going well for the rest. <laughs> yeah, I, can, um, I can hear you. Good. Yeah. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. So I, I think we can um, close the poll. Um, yeah, the majority here has uh, has uh, voted. So I will close the poll and launch the results. Is that okay, Sophia? Yeah, thank you. So, Sophia, are you going to... Uh, Tell about the results. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, we can. Uh, yeah, I was. I was just thinking that uh, it, it's it's quite diverse, right, Sean? Like how how it's uh, like a lot of people really um, steer into the specialized fish markets, which is actually what the Southern Europe is demanding. Yeah, exactly. I see some mainstream retail markets, and I. Uh... In, in, in Holland, I never saw it in, in the retail market. I, well, I barely see it, uh, grouper or snapper. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In southern, I live in Spain. Uh, so in Spain, of course, I see some uh, some, some grouper and snappers in, uh, in the fresh stores of the, of the supermarkets, the retail, the retailers. Yeah. But normally it's mm -hmm. here, of course, I live in Spain. Uh, so normally it's fish from the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, okay. If we speak about ah, developing yeah. the competition. Uh, yeah, the competition exactly, of course, because logistics is much more okay. easy to, um, to have it here in Spain. It is just catching in the, in, the, in the night, and the next morning it's already in the supermarkets. Um, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. yeah, being a being a, a company from overseas, like in a developing countries, so it's it will be quite difficult to to reach the retail market, the mainstream retail market. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's uh, yeah more the, the food services sector and I think retail that are the most the most possibilities next to the specialized fish markets. But mm -hmm. of these four, mainstream mm -hmm. retail market will be the most the most complicated. Yeah, because right. I think before you can actually enter the mainstream retail market, then you really need to, you know, meet like all the like a lot of requirements and. Uh, uh, there are there are more demands basically because for example in cruise ships I know that there is more demand for like uh, safety seals as well as uh, um, all the legal requirements and I think it's also the same for the mainstream and a lot of it if you want we fish for example you'd go to the ethnic retail if you if you want to buy one or the specialized yeah fish, or, fish or market. specialized fish market where what you see in, in the retail market well normally what what mm. The retail market, the, the, the supermarkets want to sell what was the most current to sell. So they sell the, the salmon yeah, and the cod. The, <laughs> the, the, the soul, the, the, yeah, the fish pieces that everybody knows. So it's the retail market is mm -hmm. difficult yeah, to, uh, to reach. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, as thank we you said very earlier, much for it's this. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you very much for this further explanation. Um, I think we can go to uh, to the questions uh, now from the public. Um, there are a couple of people who raised their hands. Indeed, uh, we will give the floor to you in a, in a minute. And there are also some people who uh, put a question in the question box. So both is possible. Um, um, I'll hide the poll again. Yes. Um, so uh, there's. Uh, one, Mr. Uh, Robert Garcia, and I will uh, try to unmute him now, and uh, so he can pose his question. Uh. Hello, uh, thank you. I just have a question because um, you said, Sophia, that uh, there is uh, like a, um, I don't know, I, I didn't get it if it was a future tendency or something that is already happening but you said uh, you mentioned something about the frozen like uh, um, that is uh, a tendency that is growing in this case uh, mm -hmm. do you see this, uh, this um, fact as something that can be achievable for our exporters 
in in and if in that case you see a as something possible do you do you think this uh would be frozen from the origin or would be or it would be necessary to have some distributor in 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 europe that uh, makes the frozen process and the packaging for retail for example how do you see it happening if it is happening or how do you see it happening if it's it if if it is something as a tendency in the future thank you mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, later on in the market and en entry part, we will discuss this further, but it's definitely, um, I think as an exporter, you also need to have um, some options for, for your clients. So if, for example, you offer um, fillets of 170 to 220 grams, then um, that is something that's uh, um, already favorable to the importer. But indeed, you are right, Roberto, when you said that there there is also an opportunity for um, to export it whole because actually that's how you export it to Europe and then uh, further reprocess it in uh, uh, in southern Europe, for example, in Spain or France. Uh, maybe John can also um, give some insights on this. Yeah, that, that happens, but only in the fresh business. So, so they import it uh, in fresh condition. Okay. And then the processing is taking mm -hmm. is taking uh, a place also in, in fresh. So it, the, the fish is sold. It's not going to be uh, It's not going to be frozen, for example. Um, mm. Freezing, well, well, important fresh fish imported here in Europe, only for the emergency cases. Uh, the fish is being the, uh, is being frozen, but it will be sold as a second-hand fish. So if you know, speak about yeah, yeah, um, increasing frozen products, you have to process it already. You have to froze it, freeze it already in origin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. To cut also one further process, actually, because then you know, you, if you, if you if you if you if you have that option to to sell to your buyer in Europe, then it's already like one process already cut off. So that's actually also much more favorable for them. Yes, exactly. That's that's what I do with the fresh fish. I know a lot of customers, you know, in Holland, mm -hmm. Germany, also that they import it, had them and get it. Um, uh, yeah. Always got it. Sometimes we have, but normally it's headed and gutted. And then the, the process is processed mm -hmm. like, like the customer wants. They want, uh, they want portions, they want fillets of 100 grams or 150 grams. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Mm -hmm. But normally, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's quite usual to have a fresh fish yeah. fr being imported in the whole, uh, in the whole gutted. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I hope the question has been answered uh, So already processed. Um, <laughs> I, uh, we have another question um, from Mr. Marty. I will uh, look for him and unmute him. Yes. Hello, how are you? Uh, thanks for, for this uh, useful seminar. Uh, I wanted to ask, many of, of the reef fish will come from small scale fisheries, but how do you see these in terms of complying to this, the state port control uh, to entering Europe, uh, as this segment has limited possibilities to prove that this doesn't come from IUU fishing? Uh, I think that's a thing that we will discuss in the next uh, next chapter, uh, Sophia. If you don't mind, uh, Juan, yeah, then we, we keep this question for, uh, for in about uh, 20 minutes. I'm sorry? Uh, can we wait with answering this question uh, about uh, 20 minutes? Yes, yes, yes. No, a big no, part no. of the following we uh, will, we will. part will about this, uh, this thing. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, I see um, a message, John, that your voice is far away. So maybe uh, speak a little bit more closer to the microphone, uh, please. Um, then oh. there is someone else who raised the hand. Let me see. Which, which is uh, Mr. Alexander Luang Kali. Um, I will give unmute him now. Um, oh, he has to. Uh, please, Mr. Luang Kali, please unmute yourself as well. Mm. Yeah, okay. Yes. You listen yes. to me? 
Okay. Yes, now we can hear you. Goede morgen. Goede morgen voor allemaal. Ja, ik ben Alexander. I'm I'm Indonesian graduate from Wageningen University. And I have questions special for uh, Sophia Balot. Salamat uh, for your presentation. Uh. <laughs> Thank you, uh, uh, Pinoy. <laughs> so I have question like. Uh, Terima kasih. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Welcome. Um, I would like to mm -hmm. see uh, what you, the price. Uh, do you don't you give me? Can you elaborate the price because uh, between whole and and what is name or what we call. Um, with the fillet it's quite different so mm. can you give the trend of the price during uh, like a five years so we have uh, uh, we can forecast how much because you know uh, indonesian uh, has problems to enter europe because of yeah. um, we have delivered some lots of products but we must pass the inspection without defects or failure so it's quite hard for us yeah so if we know the consequence of forecasting or the price, so we can uh, give some suggestion for our clients to consider Europe as a market. Because if you see you just few minutes before you present it about what they call uh, Southern Europe and mm -hmm. it's like 66 and between 36 to 46 kilograms per capita, Indonesian yeah. in Indonesian own country already 60 kilograms per capita per year. So please, mm -hmm. uh, the price is important. Thank you very much. Half the uh, all of Alemal. <laughs> Thank you. I think uh, if if you don't mind, we, we will cover the prices later in the in the presentation. So uh, this is actually going to be one of the slides that will be presented. Is that okay? Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, okay. Yes. Uh, yeah, we will we will cover it in a in a bit. <laughs> okay. I I think yes. we can indeed uh, move forward to the next part of your presentation, which is about mm -hmm. how to enter the European markets. Yeah, yeah. I think this is where a lot of um, uh, the questions may be answered as well. So, in the previous section, it was just more about like the potential. Is there actually a potential, and whether which countries are actually uh, have the potential. Potential. So we'll, we'll go into the details now with the market um, entry requirements. So that will cover the questions of our friends about um, um, sustainability as well as, uh, you know, if, if you have a small fishery, for example. Mm. Okay, so now we go to the part two, which is the, the market entry. Um, so if you want to export reef fish products to Europe, it is important to meet, as I said, the legal requirements of the European Union. and. Um, that includes, for example, a food assurance plan like the HACCP. It is a mandatory guarantee for um, for the European market. And as a, as a, I think one of the the, the persons who have um, questioned earlier, um, sometimes reef fish are also are indeed part of uh, small fisheries, and they are um, sometimes part of a bycatch. So, for example. A lot of them are also demersal uh, species, meaning that they uh, live uh, uh, at the bottom of the ocean. So it's it's quite a, um, they are quite a prone to being uh, to to for the IUU fishing, which is the illegal un underreported, um, unregulated fishing, and that means that uh, when you when you um, are, are part of uh, that kind of practice, then you cannot also enter Europe. Because as you know, in Europe, there is a, a lot of uh, sustainability requirements and that includes actually MSC, which is the Marine Stewardship Council um, seal. Or if, if you're not MSC certified yet, then a FIP or the um, Fishery Improvement Project. So these are all um, parts of the requirements of Europe. Um, and this is, of course, to maintain the high standard of uh, imports um, of seafood. Yeah, and as I told you earlier, there's a lot, much more um, requirements, for example, in luxury restaurants or in um, cruise ships. Yeah. All right. So what are the legal requirements that um, reef fish must comply with? So as I mentioned earlier, there are the usual requirements, which is the safety requirements, HACCP, and also um, the additional requirements, which can be the MSC, or if, if it's farmed, then the ASC seal. 
Um, also, you have to learn about the European food safety requirements and the catch certificates for IU and IUU fishing. So, for example, it, um, these species are prone to mislabeling, um, as you see in the reports, and they can be, for example, um, mislabeled as rock uh, fish or tilapia even. So these are things that the European uh, Union really um, controls a lot. And you see that we, we have this system in Europe called the RASSFF. So in that rapid alert system, you can really um, see um, what kind of violations um, exporters, for example, um, commit. and. A lot of it is also on bycatch or in the metal content of the fish, which will also be um, explained later. Um, yeah. And next. Okay. So what are the bio requirements that um, reef fish must comply with? So uh, so here, here, here we go, like with the, what kind of uh, products actually are um, in demand. So for the ethnic food sector, um, which is the ethnic uh, retail um, supermarkets, that's whole fish or steaks. Um, of course, they are frozen. You can find them in the frozen section. These are presented this way, this way because um, of course the, the, the people who try to find it, like immigrants, for example, like I do, we want to prepare it um, in the same way that we are familiar preparing. It. So, for example, if it's a, if we are um, accustomed to um, preparing a snapper as a whole fish, then we wanted to buy it as a whole. So, therefore, these are presented in ethnic retail supermarket as a whole fish or also steaks if um, we need more convenient products. And for food service sector, as John has mentioned earlier, there is much more opportunity in selling frozen, whole gutted, filleted, and portioned um, uh, reef fish. So this means, especially for the northwestern Europe, uh, this is, is particularly the case. And um, of course, for the food safety requirements, there's the BRC. So um, that's something that you also need to, to look at when you're exporting, especially, for example, to UK. Yeah, and for the main Stream retail, there's not a lot of demand for this, as John has mentioned. But if you are going to, um, to for example, work with the uh, big retailers, then um, MSC uh, is preferred as well. And if you, for example, do not have an MSC, then you can start with a, a fishery improvement project or just working with your local government on how to improve um, the fishery, um, the fishery. Uh, of your of of your reef fish and um, as this is a very small kind of niche market, it can be actually um, these are usually part of as you know that the the harmonized system code for it is the frozen fillet section. So there's not really like a lot of, of data on it. But if you're going to um, export it to Europe, then first the labeling requirements is a must, especially for um, filleted portions and also. Um, yeah, the sustainability requirements is also very high, especially for um, the mainstream retail. All right. <clears throat> okay. Okay. So then now we go to through what channels can you get the reef fish to the European market? So um, fresh fish consignments are usually exported on ice by air um, in boxes. And it's important, of course, to keep the temperature of these fish products. As you know, um, these are fresh. Um, to maintain the quality and the longer shelf life. And for frozen consignment, these are usually shipped to Europe um, in reefer containers. And you can, of course, decide with the shipping line what reefer, what kind of reefer contain, container you will you will use. And um, for for specialized importers of these products, it depends really on the end market. Sometimes um, products are reprocessed, but usually they are shipped. Uh, already like portion filleted and uh, gutted and um, as you see on the screen there are some uh, importers who deal with reef fish specifically and maybe they can be part of a, um, a full um, other species kind of consignment because as we mentioned earlier it's a very niche kind of market and therefore you know the the, the the volumes may not be as much and therefore sometimes importers depending on your importer they may require you to um include it in like a a, a big a bigger consignment for example with the frozen reef fish part of it and you can see here amacor you can also check bonesca um for for for, for exporting uh, frozen reef fish into europe 
you can also check the, these websites on the screen if you if you want to check um, uh, for fresh reef fish. All right. Okay, so now we go to the um, end market segmentation, which is like where your products actually go. So first we go to the ethnic uh, retail market. Uh, there, is, there are lots of ethnic retail markets, especially in Northwestern Europe, and you can find them, for example, if you Google Asian supermarket, Asian grocery store, African supermarket, ethnic supermarkets. These are all um, maybe keywords that you can use to find where there is a demand for this and usually there are much more larger retail chains especially in bigger city cities like uh, for example um, in France in Paris, Lyon, uh, Marseille and then in, um, in the Netherlands in Amsterdam or in The Hague or in Belgium as well so in the big cities they also have a larger um, uh, ethnic population there as well so the products that are sold there are as I mentioned earlier, whole or frozen steaks. All right, and usually the ethnic retail market is actually composed of um, the, the people who go there are usually, of course, the, um, the ethnic population, but there is also an increasing number of um, the local population that goes there. So there is an opportunity to actually introduce your product to the local population, for example, to Europeans. Um, usually the ethnic retail market consists of like maybe 70% uh, to 80% the ethnic population but there is also a lot of locals going there you know trying to familiarize themselves with uh, other types of seafood products so there is indeed a market for that you can tap especially now with people experimenting on different types of fish or food especially with the quarantine and the lockdown so these are something that you can indeed uh, take cue on all right Okay, so now we go to the food service industry. So the food service industry is usually, of course, uh, restaurants or cruise liners. Um, and the demand for this are, of course, uh, fillets and the portion products. So usually they are served, you know, like in fancy plates and th these are already filleted. And um, for, so there is an opportunity to um, sell to food service industry for like frozen, filleted, gutted um, uh, reef fish. And for specialized fish markets, uh, especially in Southern Europe, there can also be a variety of options there. So they can be steaks, frozen, refreshed products, and sometimes you can also, um, of course, find uh, fresh uh, fish products. All right. Okay, so now we see like this uh, this uh, um, kind of flow chart. So how does the the the, the reef fish actually end up in the market? So there is an exporter. So depending on what kind of uh, product you are exporting, whether it's frozen or therefore you will deal with reefer containers or fresh through air freight. So you need like a local agent or the an importer or a wholesaler who will. Um, take your products from you and i also listed that down earlier well, what kind of importers you can uh, check out or look at and then it goes af after after it passes through the importer or the wholesaler then it goes through the european wholesaler or the ethnic retailer so there is in europe especially um there are there is a lot of trading that's happening especially in um in uh, the netherlands for example belgium or germany so you might want to consider there is always like a middleman sort of um someone who knows the industry too well industry too well and someone who can connect you to various uh, European wholesalers, uh, food service industry or ethnic retailers. So if you're a, if you're a developing country exporter looking into um, connecting to Europe, it's good that you establish connection with these uh, fish importers because they know what channels you can uh, where, 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 where your product have um, the potential to go to go to especially in the end market. so yes okay so now we go to the um, competition that you face on the european reef fish market so of course uh it's a very niche product but it still has some competition uh that is uh, uh that fa that it faces especially for southern europe with the local consumption of the fish caught in the mediterranean sea and also other fish fillets um such as um also mahi mahi tuna or swordfish 
like um, some also considered some of the the kind of like the special or unique kind of uh, uh, niche uh, species as well. So um, if you also you are also competing with companies, uh, a lot of it uh, who have already um, established um, connection to Europe. So for example they are already selling other types of fish and they want to expand their portfolio for example or they are already undergoing um, a fishery improvement project so that's also one of the one of the um, your competition as well and John here will um, uh, give some insights as well like as to as to the types of uh, the the fish and how we can learn from a uh, from the comp from your competition, so you know, like uh, you from your competition, and also um, see where your potential is. So I can turn the presentation now to John um, for the countries and companies in competition. So maybe I can go here. Yeah, on base of competition, I would like to to show you a, a very nice website of a company from Indonesia uh, because your competition mm -hmm. for groupers and snappers coming from uh, from from all the world. Uh, I, I could have a website from a company from Morocco or Mauritania or Senegal, for example, but that's not exactly the fish you're going to compete with. That is just fish in a box with a, a bit of eyes and then going to the thousand part of Spain. Very cheap, but there's no guarantee of nothing. But I would like to, to show you a company in Indonesia which says it, uh, it has done it quite good, uh, selling quite a lot to, to Europe also. Um, I will show you something that you will have to have in mind when you want to go to, to Europe. Uh, Intan Seafood, a uh, company from Indonesia, so I was told you it's a company for, for several kinds of fish, also the tropical fishes like the snappers and the groupers. Um, if you go a bit down, uh, Sophia, please. Um, this company has a lot of, oh, there's another kind of, website I was looking at, but uh, as this, this intense seafood has a lot of uh, yeah quality measures. Can you go up a bit, uh, Sophia? Mm -hmm. Is, oh, is this the one? Best, yeah, best. okay. It's in the about <laughs> section. <laughs> exactly. Uh, a, bit, uh, a bit up, uh, please. Down? And uh, just uh, somewhat more up. The text. Up, up, up. That's one. Okay. The, the fish is supply from Indonesia. Um, this is a short story of, of the company, Pinton Seafood. Uh, I want to, to, to highlight some things which are quite, quite important, uh, except for the, uh, the products which we're going to speak about later on. If you go to the second paragraph of this, this text, um, you can see uh, the word fisheries improvement projects. Yeah, um, and I like I'm, it. Exactly. And then I'm looking at some business support organizations which are also listening at this moment. Uh, except for the company, of course. But that is very important, a very important project um, by uh, authorization here in, I think it's in Europe, I'm not sure. Uh, but this FIP, Fisheries Improvement Products, is to guarantee the sustainability of your product. And consumers nowadays in Europe, they want sustainability. They want to have the guarantee that we are not uh, going to overfish the oceans. Uh, fishing improvement projects, every country, because it's country-wise, it's not uh, company-wise, each country can, can, can add for this, uh, for this project. Uh, Indonesia is doing it already uh, for snapper and grouper and other dimensional fish, as you can see in Indonesia. Uh, but I yeah, certainly recommend also companies like uh, countries like Panama or Costa Rica or in Africa or other countries in Indonesia or in Asia to be part of that fishery improvement project. The FIP fishery improvement project is the preliminary project for having MSC later on. MSC is the highest mm. standard you can have for sustainability here in Europe. So I know that Panama, for example, has already some FIP projects for other kinds of fish, uh, for, for, the, for the tuna, for example. Uh, but I certainly recommend to insert also group and snapper in this kind of uh, fish fishery improvement projects. Can you go down a bit, uh, Sophia, please? Yes. Certification? Certifications. That's another important part to be able to, to export to Europe. Uh, has a, well, 
would be very nice if you have it, but it's almost not having any sentence to have it uh, to show it to to European importers. You need at least BRC or IFS, which are the two standards which are normally accepted in Europe. There are some other certifications also, FSSA 20, 22,000, for example. But um, I prefer the BRC certification because BRC is very uh, demanded also in the United Kingdom and in England. Mm. So that's why you can yeah. use a BRC. It's, it's a very nice certification of quality. So it's for your processing plan to have a source uh, certified. Another yeah. thing, uh, so we have sustainability, we have quality, but we also want to know what's about uh, CSR, uh, the corporate social responsibility. And therefore, you have also some uh, certifications like uh, like CEDEX, which is just a bit above or here downwards also. Empowering responsible supply chains. Uh, there are several CSR certifications available that are right, a lot of local certifications also. Uh, but uh, European consumers want to know what's happening with the fishermen, what's happening with the, with the people which are working in the processing plant. Um, so you have to have, a, yeah, it, it is recommended to have a kind of uh, CSR certification also in your program, in your company to be able to export to, uh, to Europe. It's not obligatory for now, but a lot of companies already in the northern part of Europe are asking for it. They start asking for it, and for sure, within three or four years, it will be demanded. So it will be necessary to have it. Mm -hmm. When you go to another, uh, the other uh, page, the processing, Sophia. Yeah, yeah, here. This is uh, all about uh, quality. Uh, well, easy to say, of course, that my quality is the best. If you ask uh, an African country, an African company, asking for their quality, they say my quality is the best of. Uh, well, there is, but unfortunately, the consumers or the companies in Europe are thinking another way. Intensivo uh, has done it quite quite good. Uh, they have a good uh, quality control, um, so they know how to handle uh, the quality from the moment that it's fished, uh, caught the fish, until the supply to uh, to the consumers. Uh, a bit down, please, uh, Sophia. Yeah. For the fish cutting. Uh, they know how to add, how to add value. Uh, for example, if you ask uh, companies in, in Senegal to, to fill out the fish, well, they barely are able to do it. But people in Indonesia, they, they, they aren't very good. And also you in Central America or other places of the world, you have to have possibilities to, to cut your fish in a good manner or more, according to the European standards. Um, yeah. yeah, and to have some, some quality control all around. So processed, uh, good, uh, good cleaning, good freezing capacity, this technology. Um, that's why I wanted to show you this website. It's the state of the art, so it's not, uh, not you have to work during the coming years to that level. Uh, but I want to show you just how competition can be. Is there something more uh, downwards, Sophia? Metal detectors, yes. of course, very important. Laboratory, uh, it's costing a lot of money. Um, but I'm sure that people, consumers in Europe, uh, are going to ask you for some analysis, analysis on heavy uh, metals, for example, or, or bacteria, or whatever kind of biological things, chemical things, they, they are going to ask for it. So you have to have a, a possibility to have uh, an own laboratory or contract a local or a national laboratory to analyze your, your fish. Yeah. We go to the next page, uh, Sophia, about uh, the products. Yeah. yeah. Very nice ones. And I, sorry to say, but I don't know them. Of course, I know snapper, but there are a lot of snappers. I do not know a pinjello snapper. I do not know a <laughs> sweet lip. I think it's a grouper or something like that, or a snipper. But money, I have heard of it. A ruby snapper. I really don't know what kind of fish is, and I'm sure that in Central America they don't know either. So what I want to say uh, that each fish has its own price, but which price? If you can't compare it with other kinds of continents, uh, a snapper from Panama or from Costa Rica is quite different, quite different than a snapper from Indonesia. You cannot compare it. So that's why I want to come back also on the question of, uh, of Mr. Roancali. Um, 
don't don't fix only on price. Uh, there's much more to see than only price. If you want to sell to Europe, you, you need six six things. You have to have a nice product with all the qualities and certifications. Uh, you have to have your promotion. You have to have your, your website. You have to go to, to business fair sometimes. You have to know how to con have to contact with, with, with customers. You have to know to who are you going to sell. Are you going to sell to Spain? Well, then you have your competition from Senegal, Mauritania, very cheap, and then you, are, you also will have a cheap price. If you want to go to northern part of Europe, your price could be much more better. Another thing to have in, have in mind, people. What are you going with your, uh, what are you doing with your CSR, with your people, your fishermen, your, your people working in the processing plant? There's also points which are very important to have, uh, uh, to, to communicate to your customers in Europe. It's time more, and also the, by the fifth point is the planet. So how is your sustainability? Can you uh, guarantee the sustainability? It's almost even important as the price nowadays. And of course you have the price. So you have your product, you have your distribution, you have your promotion, you need to have to, to the people, you need to, uh, to know how you handle the, the, the planet. And at last time, last point, you have to know how much price is. But you have to see it. As a, as a mix, don't focus only on, on the price, please. Have those six points in, there, in mind. Sophia. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I think in the, in, so in the next slide, I will focus now on the prices. So as John has mentioned that it really is uh, incomparable to, to, to do a lot of uh, pricing comparisons in between uh, species as well, especially that we fish is a very niche um, product. So let's go to the this one. One okay. now, one now. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So for the so these are example prices for the for the frozen and fresh supermarket. As you see, um, the market is very niche, so therefore it's also stable in terms of demand. Um, but in, as what John has mentioned, that um, it's not just the species that you're um, uh, comparing the prices, but also the quality of your product. So uh, especially for for um, reef fish, so you know they're quite attractive, really nice kind of a uh, fish, and therefore the organoleptic pictures are also um, uh, taken into consideration so for example the color the freshness the eyes for example the scales if they're you know like these are things that um, that also um, are factors in terms of determining your product so indeed like with the frozen segment of reef fish the wholesale prices can um, range between two euros to 20 euros per kilogram and for the fresh market, it's much, of course, much more um, expensive. And that can range between, um, it can go up to 50 um, euro per kilogram. So as you can see here in Germany, the skin on grouper fillet for 200 grams is 31.49 euros per kilogram. And in Spain, um, it's, it goes up until four, 48 euros per kilogram. So um, it really depends on uh, what kind of uh, market you're looking at, also what kind of, um, um, uh, wh where where would you sell it? So would it be in a retail uh, ethnic supermarket or would it be in a food service sector or would it be in specialized fish shops where it's sold as whole fresh, for example? So um, mm. yeah, it, 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 uh, it varies per, uh, per species as well as it varies mm. per, um, per market as well. To give a, to give a, uh... A very simple example, you can compare it with a Volkswagen Polo or a Ferrari. A Volkswagen yeah. Polo costs 10,000 euros, a Ferrari costs 200,000 euros. So where is the difference of that 190,000 euros? It's not only the difference in production costs. There is a yeah. whole story behind it. And you, you have to see it like this also in the, in the, in the, in the reef fishes. There are so much variables that you can use mm. you have to sell it it's not just mention a price and here you have your fish it's much more you have to mm -hmm. imagine and also for example mm, and also for example what kind of um um requirement uh, requirements you already met so for example for msc or um for msc uh uh fish i can imagine uh, th that 
that would really fetch quite high, for example, in retail, um, in mainstream retail markets. So it, it, it really depends on um, uh, various factors and variables, as, as John has said. Yeah. And with that note, uh, we went to the key taking points or the key points that uh, we want you to take home in this uh, um, webinar. And uh, at first, we cannot emphasize uh, the importance of uh, food safety certifications, the BRC requirement that John has mentioned, um, as well as, of course, all the legal requirements, the food sa safety certifications, and in addition, on top of that, the sustainability um, certifications. And uh, I've read actually in one of the comments that um, it's important to uh, work also with your government. So, especially for fish fishery improvement projects, it's it's good that you also um, contact your your government, especially in terms of like the catch uh, the catch requirements and also the 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 volumes are required to to do fishing for reef fish because they're quite special fish. Um, uh, so yeah, indeed, like this is um, this is something that you can not you can uh, you can partner with private organizations, just as what other FIP countries are doing, but also with the governmental organizations um, or with the government itself. Um, there is also a very strict labeling requirement in Europe, so you 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 can sell your fish um, as it uh, you know as it as it is. So you cannot for Europe is very specific in terms of the labeling requirements. So um, they would really report and flag you, and that uh, Europe has a system for that specifically, the one that I mentioned earlier, the RASFF. So it's a rapid alert system that will really flag you when uh, when you did. Um, something wrong so the customs for example really checks in it and uh yeah just uh, they will give you a hard time <laughs> basically and of course uh customer education and storytelling is important as i've mentioned earlier it's a very niche product and therefore it has a unique story to tell and with that um, in mind, you should also invest in uh, how you uh, market your story. So, um, what is the origin of the fish? What recipes we can share um, in order to um, expand our market, for example? So, in Europe, um, I have noticed um, really that, um, especially for value-added products, there's a lot of uh, uh, experimentations on uh, on uh, on uh, recipes, also flavors. Like Europeans want to um, really also try other cuisines, so it's something that uh, you can use as a selling point. And um, these are all important, especially uh, if you if you look into the future. Um, brand recognition and presentation is also um, important. So, as uh, uh, John has mentioned earlier, with a with a company example from Indonesia, they already have quite an estab established um, uh, company, and uh, you know their marketing is um, they have nice. Uh, nice uh, photos as well so you need to build also on your brand and your message more importantly so what the, the, your message uh, in selling your fish is also how you present your company um, and also of course lastly with the uh, um, uncertainty that uh, COVID-19 has uh, brought on in Europe especially and especially also in developing country export and export nations uh, it's really it, everything is volatile so you, you must need to um, not only act, not only see uh, things on the short term, but also in long term. So, is it worth investing in a sustainability sale? Is it worth investing in CSR um, practices? Um, so these things you have to really assess um, yourself and also see how how this uh, trend will develop in the long term. But um, as we mentioned. Uh, sustainability is indeed the key um, uh, requirement in Europe and it will be much more so in the next uh, years to come so yes I think that is it <laughs> uh, maybe we can um, you have maybe additional uh, things to say um, yes uh, before we go to the second block of questions and answers we will uh, do another poll uh, correct so um, the next poll uh, question is uh, what would you consider the main challenge for entering the European market and before I launch the poll I want to request John to uh, speak close to his uh, microphone uh, in uh, well speaking oh. <laughs> 
So what would you consider the main challenge for entering the European markets? So is it lack of certification, high barriers in finding limited connection with uh, or limited connection with importers, um, lack of knowledge on the EU, EU market or existing competition? Uh, please submit. Okay, I think uh, quite a number of you have already uh, voted. Um, and I will uh, close the, the poll in a bit so you can all see the results and uh, Sophia and uh, John can discuss them. Hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, it, I think it's quite clear <laughs> how uh, it, these are also really very pressing problems, I, I would say, or like like the challenges and with a lack of certification, uh, especially I think yeah, on right. sustainability part. Um, yeah, because not a lot yeah, of I reef fish it, is actually um, certified. Yeah, it, it's it's um it's a process, uh, uh, a progress. You know, it's it, it is a niche market, so in niche markets the certifications mm. are very important. But not uh, Sorry? obligatory for now. I think. But but if you go to to a to a high running article like like COD or Juna, for example, yes, you need a certification. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but it, it's it's not it's in progress, so it's not for tomorrow, but it's something for next year. But you have to start already. Uh, yeah, yeah. When I when That's I right. when you speak about the reefers, yeah, when you speak about snappers and groupers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and indeed John was right in saying that like the MSC takes years to achieve, but you can mm. always start with, with with in partnership with the government or also in, with private companies and you can use this as a, as a leverage and as an advantage in, in terms of communicating your products. And if you're, if you're, if you're on the path to achieving, uh, you know, with fishery improvement projects and like the CSR, um, kind of requirements and you're already halfway there it's it's uh, once you start it's uh, it's a process and a lot of uh, mm. like a lot of a lot of importers as well here they they recognize the value of a, a fishery improvement project a fishery improvement project so it's it's a uh, it's it's already quite valuable to already have started mm. i would say okay um i yeah, can the other, the other um, two points sorry john okay <laughs> and the, the other the, the other two points, high barriers in finding limited connection with importers. Of course, we are now in a bit of strange situation. If not, uh, you can go to a, to a business fair like uh, Brussels, Barcelona, which was uh, Brussels, or to Conchemar, for example, or in Bremen in the northern part of Germany. There's also a nice affair, but it's at the moment a bit uh, difficult. Uh, yeah. We do mm -hmm. plan a kind of business to business matchmaking for some companies in Costa Rica and Panama. With European importers in February, uh, so sorry, in September, mm -hmm. and the lack of knowledge on the EU, EU market. I hope that uh, Sana is going to explain something about uh, what we can do. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I will uh, tell you a little bit more about what CBI is offering in terms of uh, uh, market information uh, after uh, the second Q and A uh, session. So. Mm -hmm. um, I saw also questions coming in regarding uh, certification or remarks. Um, I will now, now hide the poll and then um, I want to ask, uh, because the question was already posted a little while ago, but Mr. Juan Ayala, uh, if you want to um, um, pose your question or um, remark uh, in voice. Is that yeah? Hmm. 
I, I cannot hear him. Um, so um, I think I can pose this question uh, myself. Um, so his question was, uh, does certification like Global Gap uh, are aligned with EU request of seafood uh, safety? Uh, shall I answer it, Sophia? Yes, please. Uh, global gap is normally for the uh, the farmed uh, species. Uh, well, there is one company from Costa Rica which is listening. Also, they will have to insert something like global gap or is the C, which is the counterpart of a global gap. But for wild fishing, there is no uh, no global gap uh, necessary. It's more important the FIP or the uh, the MSC. Mm. Okay. Global yes. gap is more for the farmed uh, farmed shrimps, farmed fish species. It's not not so for uh, not not for the wild caught uh, fishes. Okay. Indeed, he he also mentioned that he participated in an agriculture webinar, and there uh, from that event, it seemed that global gap was a solid option. But yes, as you're mm. saying, it's more for yeah. agriculture. Um, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Um, Refish is usually a marine cod. All right. Yeah. Yes. Um, let me see. Another question that was uh, posed is um, uh, so, and and uh, this uh, person asked me to pose the question. Uh, Sophia said the first stage of our fish enters the ethnic market. Um, so, do you think that uh, diasporas play an important role in the European market? Um, so, that that is a question. Ah, okay. <laughs> I thought that was, a, that was a continuing one. Yeah, um, I think definitely there is a, a a part to play in that, and that's why, and that's why the the ethnic retail market is a really um, one of the um, options where you can uh, like the channels where you can uh, where the mark where the product ends and what you say what you say about the diaspora is very important because as more immigrants come to europe and not only just you know immigrants coming to europe but also europeans uh, traveling outside europe that's also a very important uh, factor in it because as europeans get more exposed to other types of fishes therefore they are more likely to be more um, warm in terms of um uh, you know, eating or trying out different types of cuisine. And um, in terms of the ethnic retail market, as I've mentioned earlier, that a lot of not only the ethnic population comes to visit the retail market or the Asian African stores, but also um, the local population. So it's it's a whole um, dynamics also related to migration, um, especially also with politics. So indeed like if if the borders of europe remains uh, open within eu and therefore uh, more people um travel uh, and experience more cultures and therefore it's it really uh, plays a huge part can i comment something on this market part uh, the ethnic market is always being considered as a as a cheap high volume market but that's not the case anymore um Ethnic market should be considered a, a mm. quality-minded market nowadays. So it's not like 10 years ago that you can mm. send a box of 10 kilos of small fishes which had a smell that you want to throw it away. Nowadays yeah, not, it's not good. nice yeah, yeah, one yeah. kilo yeah. bags of 500 grams uh, bags, a nice cut, and mm -hmm. also they want some um, guarantees. I know a very big company in Europe, mm -hmm. uh, in, in Holland, in the Netherlands, which is um, Specialized on the ethnic market, they have about uh, 40 or 50 mm -hmm. truckloads every week, and not only fish but also mm -hmm. herbs, potatoes, bananas, that kind of things. And they send me uh, a list of all the requirements they have, and that is a very long list. So uh, please, if you want to sell to the ethnic market, don't consider it a second-hand market. It's it's a very yeah. it's a high quality market nowadays. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and especially sorry, Sophia, since can... ethnic retail markets are especially prolific. Yeah, can can you hear me now? Yeah, now now we can hear you again. It seems a little bit of can a delay on the 
in yeah. the sound. Ah, okay. Yeah. Yeah, no, indeed, John is right, because as I've mentioned, mentioned also earlier that ethnic retail um, market is, situa is situated in big cities and therefore you know the standard of living also in big cities are, are also very high and therefore um, you know, yeah it, it, it's not considered like a second-hand market you know like um, like that but also like something that you would really also sell is especially um, to people so this is a product you're presenting to the to the urban market urban population and therefore um, yeah, quality is of course expected. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, um, uh, we don't have much time anymore. So uh, I think we uh, close this part of the presentation and I will tell you a little bit more about uh, where to find more market information uh, on the European market uh, for fish and seafood. Uh, thank you very much, Sophia and John. Um, I hope uh, the other participants in the audience found it as interesting as I did. And um, yeah, that all the questions uh, have been answered to your satisfaction. Um, I see I see a couple of questions coming in, um, but we can uh, share that uh, by uh, by email. Uh, we can answer them by email. Um, so, Sophia, can you please uh, go to the next slide? Um, yes. So, actually, uh, this presentation was uh, uh, was a presentation of two of our market studies on we fish, uh, which is a product fact sheet about market potential for we fish and a product fact sheet on the market entry for we fish. And you can find those studies with a lot more detail, even. Uh, through this link uh, that is now on your screen. Um, and as I mentioned in the beginning of this webinar, uh, CBI offers free market intelligence uh, for different sectors, including the fish and seafood sector. And uh, this is specifically aimed at exporters uh, from developing countries. And if you go to the next slide, Sophia. Um, so we have market studies. Uh, they are uh, for fish and seafood. They are available through this uh, link, and we have market studies about uh, the demand on the European market, about the trends, and about the market requirements, uh, the bu the buyer requirements. Uh, we also have tip studies on how to find buyers in the European market, how to get in contact with them, uh, how to do business with them, uh, which is more in terms of communication, culture, and also practically how to organize your exports. Um, and then we have a specific fact sheets on different species, um, not only on reef fish, but also on shrimp or tuna or crab. Um, and we have uh, COVID-related uh, uh, studies. Uh, we recently uh, published a couple, uh, including on uh, about the impact of COVID-19 on the fish and seafood market in Europe, but also on uh, how to respond uh, to this crisis uh, um, in the fish and seafood sector. Um, so in order to stay up to date on the latest publications, you can also sign up for our monthly newsletter. And um, next slide, as mentioned, um, we have uh, organized this webinar as part of the Connecting Central America program. And in this program, we work together with a range of partners, uh, which you can all uh, see here. And uh, this program is funded by the European Union and the Netherlands, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and uh, coordinated by uh, the Secretariat for Central American Economic Integration, or SHECA. Um, so now we have come to the end of this webinar. Um, I want to thank you very much all for attending. Um, I hope you enjoyed this webinar. Uh, please fill in our survey that appears uh, right after uh, the end, so we know um, yeah, how, how you found this webinar and the information that we provided. And uh, then on behalf of uh, CBI, I wish you all a very good day and uh, hope to see you again soon. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. bye.